introduce uh, Dr. Ian Oliver, who's sitting next to me um, here today. Um, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about um, his background, and then I'm going to pass over for the first of his two lectures. Um, and Ian's originally from Australia, and he did his PhD in soil chemistry at the University of Adelaide. I then went on to um, become a research officer uh, with CSIRO in Australia and also with the Catholic University in Leuven, um, where he was working on soil ecotoxicology with uh, Mike McLaughlin from CSIRO and Eric Smolders uh, from Leuven. After that, he came to Scotland um, to do a post-doc uh, um, with uh, um, Gus McKenzie at the um, Scottish University's Environmental Research Centre, and that was also linked to the University of Edinburgh, and he was looking at the environmental fate of depleted uranium. He then uh, spent some time in environmental regulation with the Scottish Environment Protection Agency before he took up his current position as a lecturer mm -hmm. in environmental science at Keele University, where he's uh, working on soil contaminants and remediation. Um, he's also um, an editor in terrestrial ecotoxicology for the Journal mm -hmm. of Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry. So I'll now pass it over to, to Ian. All right, folks, I, can people still hear me? Uh, yes, nope. yes. Marvellous. Okay, welcome to Mission Control. Okay, um, right, we will start from the start. Given that it is a public holiday today and it's very sunny outside, um, this should be fairly short, maybe about half an hour is all we will need. Um, if people have questions, by all means, ask I will try and listen out for questions as we go. Um, we're going to talk about the principles and practice of terrestrial ecotoxicology today. Within the lecture, we're going to cover the regulatory context. Most people want to know, is X milligrams per kilogram safe? And that is where we start in terms of, is there a problem or is there not going to be a problem? But in order to work that out, we have to use ecotoxicology. And so if we're going to talk about that, then I have to lay out for you the principles that underlie ecotoxicology. Then I'll give some examples of some classic terrestrial ecotoxicology assays. So the actual tests that are used to give you a flavor of the kind of work that's done in this area. And then we'll go into how that data is used, how we use them to construct dose response curves and a little bit of the maths underneath it. Don't worry, the maths will not be difficult. And how do we quantify these endpoints, so these ecotoxicology metrics? What do we do with the data that comes out of it? And that's where we'll end this lecture, which will set us up for the next one. Okay, so if we are going to look at environmental contamination, we often ask what concentration is safe for a chemical, or if we're talking about an element, what concentrations is safe for that element? Well, the answer can depend on the protection goal. That is the thing that you are trying to protect. It's also uh, me, reliant on... Excuse me, Ian. Yes. Uh, are, you, are you sharing your PowerPoint with us? Because we can't see it. Oh, well, that's a shame. It's been cracking so far. <laughs> um, yeah, I thought I did. Maybe I didn't. Um, let's try again. How's that? Is that better? Yes, there you go. Yeah, oh, there we go. I didn't press the button hard enough. Right. Um, okay, well, we skipped that. I've just gave the lecture scope, which you probably all heard me say, so now you can read it for yourself. We'll cover regulatory context, ecotox principles, some essays, dose response curves, and ecotox metrics. Um, okay, so this is where we got up to. Uh, if we're going to work out is a chemical safe in the soil? We have to ask ourselves, what aspect are we thinking about? What are we trying to protect? Are we trying to protect people or are we trying to protect the environment? So whether X milligrams per kilogram is safe also depends on the intended use and who's in charge because different authorities, different jurisdictions may have different um, safe levels that they consider. So if we come back to the idea of the protection goal, most 
values that you look up, you will find are trying to protect humans. So they offer human health risk assessment. So that underlies whether land is considered contaminated land or whether it's considered not contaminated land. But it's not just people that we wish to protect, as important as that is. We also want to protect the wider environment and the organisms within it. So when you look up soil values or soil limit values, you often see these kind of values as we have on the screen here. These are based on soil limits to protect people. So they have some kind of hazard, some kind of contaminant in the soil, be it arsenic or lead or um, benzene or some other contaminant, that's our hazard. And we consider different exposure pathways through to our receptors or our exposed individuals. That can be via pathways of inhalation, of direct soil ingestion, food that is covered in soil particles that we then consume, or plant uptake. So the elements or the pesticides or other contaminant going into the plant and then being taken up into our food. Children are particularly at risk here because they have lots of hand to mouth activities. As you can see this boy playing in the dirt here, putting his fingers in his mouth. So these are the kind of situations that most of these regulatory levels are trying to protect against. They're trying to protect people, considering different land uses, different levels of food production, the body mass of people, and how much food people eat from their gardens. So if you have a look at the table, you'll see that there are different values, different limit values for soils that's used for residential purposes, soils that's used for commercial purposes, and those that are used for public spaces which is all well and good for protecting people. But what about the things that live in the soil? If you are an earthworm, you don't really care whether the soil is being used for residential purposes or for public spaces. You just want to be safe. So values that are designed to protect people don't really protect the earthworms, the calimbalas, the plants, the microbes, the other things that live in the soil. So if we're going to do that, we have to come up with values that protect the organisms, not just protect ourselves. And that's what ecotoxicology is really trying to get to. So we have to have limits that protect the ecology and ecosystems. There are such values available in various jurisdictions. For example, the Netherlands have derived some of these values. Australia has its own set, and the US has through the US EPA. These are often called ecological soil screening levels, or eco-SSLs. So these are concentrations that protect ecological receptors in the soil. They're typically used as trigger values. So anything above these values are a potential risk and therefore need to be examined. And if you want to find some of these examples, one of the, the best places to look is on a Canadian website um, called the Screening Quick Reference Tables or Squirts. So if you go into any kind of search engine, Google, Yahoo, Bing, whatever, and put in Squirt's card, you'll come up with this screen that we see here with these various values, these Squirt's screening quick value reference tables. There are values for inorganic elements in soils. There are values for uh, organic contaminants. There's values for sediment. They've combined all of these so that you have a range of values that you can use as reference points. And if you dig down into them, you will see that they have also factored in ideas such as background concentrations and various things. Um, right, um, but we have to ask ourselves, where does these data points come from and how are they produced? In order to produce them, we have to go through an ecotoxicology process. So that is, we need to determine for our given chemical or element of interest, What's the concentration that causes toxicity to the organisms? And in the same time, by doing that, we can work out the concentrations that do not cause toxicity to organisms. And that's what we're really trying to find out, the levels below which no significant harm is anticipated. So the little diagram there shows a control with no added chemical. We have plants growing happily. 
but ultimately you start reaching concentrations that kills your plant off. So we can use this kind of data to identify the concentrations that cause no significant harm. And there's a whole range of different ecotoxicology assays that we can do. We can do ones for plants, such as a root elongation or plant yield measurement. Invertebrates are often looked at, where we can look at the mortality, their reproduction, their mass gain or loss, and the population growth. But we can also look at microbes. Microbials are, of course, very important for nutrient cycling and other processes. So looking after the microbes, we can make sure that our soils are fertile. So ecotoxicology has a whole range of tests that are designed to look at how chemicals are impacting on the biomass or the population or the activities of microbes, including their various functions such as nutrient mineralization. So if we're going to do that, if we're going to dose up some soil, spike up some soil in order to find the concentrations that cause these negative effects, we have to think about the process. How do we add our chemical to the soils? How do we work out what concentrations to try? Well, ideally, we want to target the concentrations that have an effect. You don't want to spend all your time and all your money setting up concentrations that don't have any impact. So typically you want to target somewhere between 10% and 75% inhibition of some control biological response. If you don't have anything to go on, then you can start off with a range finding test where you might try 0.1 milligram per kilogram, one, 10, 100, 1,000 milligrams per kilogram, run your quick test and you see where do the organisms start to fall over. And then from there, you can focus in and do a range of concentrations that allow you to quantify your data more specifically. But we have to think about how do we add the chemical to the soil. If it's water soluble, you can add it just as an aqueous solution. It's nice and easy. But if it's not water soluble, there's many chemicals that we need to test for that just do not dissolve in water. So if that's the case, then you can first dissolve it in some kind of solvent and add it as a solvent rather than an aqueous solution. But to do that, then you have to think about what kind of impact is the solvent having on your biological responses? Is the solvent going to kill off the microbes or reduce the plant growth? So we have to try and use the minimum amount of solvent possible. Then, after you've added your solvent with your chemical in it, allow time for the solvent to evaporate so that it's having the minimal impact on your biological response that you're trying to measure. You also need to run controls that only have the solvent and none of the added chemical. That way you can determine what impact, if any, your solvent is having on your biological response. Now, if your chemical that you want to test is not soluble in water, is not soluble in a solvent, then the best you can do is just add it dry and mix it through. You often just have to do the practical thing in ecotoxicology. Now I mentioned mixing. So we ask ourselves, should we homogenize our sample or should we just add it at the surface? Almost always you want to homogenize what you've added to the soil and mix it through. But there are circumstances where you wouldn't. For example, if you were trying to test some kind of pesticide or fertilizer additive, when it is applied in the field for real, it's just sprinkled on top of the soil. So if you wanted to simulate the effects of that kind of treatment, then for your ecotoxicology assay, it would be quite wrong to mix it through and to homogenize your chemical. So you would recreate the situation in the field and just surface apply. But typically, you want to homogenize the chemical that you've added so that you can examine the effects. So how many concentrations should we add and how many replicates should we do? You might think that's kind of an obvious thing, but there's quite a lot of scientific thinking behind it in working out what we should do. You should always have multiple controls. You need to establish a baseline. So lots and lots of control is better. So more control pots, the merrier really. So typically you would need at least four, it's often recommended up to about eight. So then the number of concentration levels that you add and the number of replicates that you use, it depends on the approach, it depends what you're trying to do with your ecotoxicology assay. 
The old fashioned approach, what I've called approach one, is to try and identify the no observed effect concentration or the NOEC, which is the highest concentration that you add that has no inhibition, that causes no negative impact on the organism response that you're trying to measure. So that's the NOEC. The next concentration level up is therefore the LOEC, the lowest observed effect concentration. So that's the lowest concentration that you have added that has a significant inhibition, or if you like, the lowest concentration that you've added that has a negative impact on the biological response that you are trying to measure. So if you are trying to identify the NOEC and the LOEC from your chemical, then the recommended approach is to have your four controls and then at least five concentration levels with four replicates of each concentration. That allows you to do various statistical tests, including analysis of variance or Mann-Whitney U tests to determine whether, for example, level four has had a negative impact compared to level three. So that's an approach that you see done today still, and the literature is full of NOx and LOx, but it's becoming less popular and uh, less relied upon because it's got quite a number of limitations. And when we talk about dose response curves, that will become clear. The second approach, rather than trying to identify the no observed effect concentrations, the second approach is to identify precise effect concentrations, so ECXs. So the ECX is the concentration causing X level inhibition relative to some control. Or if you like, it's the concentration that causes X percent of organisms to be inhibited. So we refer to these typically as the EC10, so it's a 10% effect level, the EC50, 50% effect level. You will also see LC10, LC50 listed quite often. Now the L just stands for lethality. So it's still measuring an effect, it's just telling you that specifically the effect that's being examined is lethality, so death. But you could use LC50s and EC50s together when you're trying to combine data, because it's still a 50% inhibition level, it's just that the thing that's being inhibited is life. Now if you're going to do this approach, if you're going to identify the EC10 or the EC50, rather than having four replicates of each concentration, here it's much better to have, after your controls, to have many different levels. So rather than having four or five levels with lots of reps, here you might have more than 10 concentration levels with no replicates, or maybe two replicates so that you've got a backup for one. But the more concentrations you apply, the better it is for calculating the EC10 and the EC50. So this approach is becoming more and more used because it's more statistically powerful and it's more scientifically robust, which I will show you shortly. Okay, if you're talking about adding some elements to soil, let's say you're trying to determine the concentration of zinc that causes toxicity, then if you're going to add zinc chloride, which is typically the case, you're not really testing the same type of zinc that's going to be in the wider environment. A metal salt is very readily available, it's very bioavailable, and so that's different to some concentration in the field that's been built up over the time. Also, if you add something like a chloride salt, you're adding lots of salt, and therefore you are increasing the ionic strength of the salt solution, which can increase the bioavailability of the metals and can change the conditions that the organisms are living in. So if you add metals, as an example, in the chloride salt or a nitrate salt, you're changing the conditions. Therefore, you can impact on the outcomes of your ecotoxicology assay. You're going to have lots of confounding factors. So that is why it's recommended to do a leaching step. So if you're going to add zinc or lead or whatever it is that you're trying to test, you should add your materials to the various concentrations that you want, but then do a leaching step where you effectively irrigate your soil to flush any of that salt through, leaving the concentrations behind. So how do you do the leaching step? Well, typically you would surface apply 
two to five pore volumes of artificial rainwater, allowing to drain between each application. So artificial rainwater is something you can make in a laboratory. It's just based on, as you would think, concentration of rainwater, things like sodium, calcium, things that you naturally find in rainwater, so that there's a little bit of salt in the water to allow some kind of exchange process to occur. So once you've leached your soil, you then can go ahead and do some final checks. Once you've added your elements and you've leached it through, you should do some checks on the pH, because if you've added lots of metals, you've probably also added lots of acid, because metal additions are often done in a very weak nitric acid solution. Therefore, you're going to be increasing the amount of acid that you add, which can lower the pH. So you want to check the pH to make sure that you haven't changed the pH too much, because if your highest concentration has resulted in a much lower pH, that can cause impacts on your organisms just because of the pH, not just because of the metals. So you want to check that your pH range has stayed within a reasonable amount. If not, if your highest concentrations have caused the pH to drop too much, then you should adjust your pH by adding some lime or something else of that type. You also want to make sure that you maintain a good moisture content. If you're going to look at how organisms behave in a soil, we have to remember that organisms need water. So you need to maintain your moisture holding capacity of about 60 to 80%. So you can do that as you add your, your soil solutions. So the concentrations that you add, you can put the required moisture into that to maintain your, um, your moisture levels. And if you record the weight of your pots once you've set them up, then twice a week you can measure them to see if they've lost any moisture through evaporation and you just add more water on top to replace the lost mass. And lastly, but most importantly, you must confirm the dose. If you've added your chemical that you're trying to test and you've done a leaching step and you've adjusted the pH, done all these kinds of things, you really have to confirm that what you're testing is actually in the soil. For example, if you think you've added up to 600 milligrams per kilogram of zinc, you should analyze your soil to make sure you have that much zinc in there. You cannot just rely on the nominal concentrations. You really have to confirm the dose and then you can use those confirmed doses in your ecotoxicology calculations. And you can also extract the pore water to measure the concentrations in the pore water. Most organisms access the chemicals in soil via the pore water. So in, in addition to just calculating ecotoxicology values based on total concentrations of the element or the chemical in the soil. We can also do calculations based on the amount in the pore water. And these can help to factor in bioavailability into our ecotoxicology assays. All right, so now I'll just go through a few examples of some ecotoxicology assays in case you ever want to do them for yourselves. Uh, the OECD Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development has got a whole host of different ecotoxicology assays for both aquatic and terrestrial situations. These are very useful because they're very well established, the conditions are completely spelled out, and people will understand what you've done just by saying the number. So here we have the terrestrial plant test. This is seedling emergence and growth. You have your soil and you spike it to the number of levels that you require. And then you sow your seeds. Typically you would add 20 or so seeds and add nutrients. Then you sit back and watch your plants grow for two to three weeks and you wait for things to start to emerge. Now after your controls have emerged, two to three weeks have gone by and you've maintained the light conditions and the temperature and the moisture conditions, you can then harvest your plants and determine the mass that has been produced, but also the percentage of emergence of those seeds. You can do this based on fresh or dry mass by drying them in the oven. And then you've got a whole bunch of data coming out the other end. Then you can plot your dose response curves 
based on percentage emergence or the yield, the biomass. Microbial function assays are, are very useful to do. So this is the carbon transformation test. Here we have soil that we pre-incubate for up to 28 days. So the idea here is that if you've had soil that's been sitting in your cupboard or in your laboratory for some time, the microbes are not properly awake. So we have to add some moisture, wake them up, give them time to recover and become active again, and then we can do our test. So we go through this pre-incubation step. Then we add our chemical to whatever number of levels we want to do. And depending on whether we're doing our no observed effect concentration approach or our EC10, EC50 based approach, you can decide how many concentrations you wish to do. Uh, here, the basic recommendation is for five. Then you incubate for 28 days. And this further makes sure that the dose that you have added, the chemical that you've added is settled into the soil and the microbes are, are properly awake. Then we add our glucose and mix it through. Then we incubate that for 12 hours. And during that process, your glucose is becoming mineralized. It's being used by the microbes in their metabolic activities. And while they do that, they release CO2, carbon dioxide. And then we simply measure the amount of carbon dioxide that is respired. You can do that by either having your soil inside a sealed jar with a headspace, which you then examine by putting in a, a needle, a syringe, pull out the amount of gas and then put it through a gas chromatograph. Or you can go the old fashioned way by having some kind of alkali trap in with the soil. So sodium hydroxide, something along that nature. It will capture the CO2 that evolves from the microbes and you can just titrate that to determine how much CO2 has been released. Either way, you end up with an amount of CO2 that's been released by your microbes. And then you can calculate the respiration rate in terms of how many grams of carbon have been transformed per gram of soil per hour. And then you can plot that on a graph, work out a dose response curve and determine your ecotox endpoints. Another important soil microbial function assay that is commonly used is in relation to nitrogen. This is the nitrogen transformation test. Again, we pre-incubate our soils to wake up the microbes. Then we add a substrate, typically loosen, at a rate of something like five grams per kilogram of soil. Then you spike your soil, adding the chemical that you're trying to test. Note that it is recommended that you add your loosen or your plant material first so that it's fully incorporated into the soil and the spike gets mixed through everything rather than having the plant separate. Then once that's all mixed together, we incubate for 28 days. We do a measurement at time zero and another one at time 28 days. And then we can work out how much of that added plant material has been mineralized all the way through to nitrate. So there you have the equation stated there. Organic matter gets mineralized to ammonia, and then that ammonium is further changed to nitrate by the microbes. So from our soil sample, we extract it with 0.1 molar potassium chloride, and we measure the nitrate that has been produced. And then we can calculate our nitrogen conversion rate in terms of how many milligrams of nitrate has been produced per kilogram of soil per day. And then again, plot our dose response curves and calculate our EC10s or our NOx and LOx. There is another version of that where we do not add loosen or a plant material, but instead just add ammonium as a salt. And then we see how the microbes convert that ammonium to nitrate. It is an easier method. It takes one step out of the equation. And so to be honest, that's the way I do it. I don't bother adding the plants unless I'm doing a carbon transformation test as well. But you end up being able to measure your nitrate transformation from that ammonium source. Moving on to earthworms. Earthworms are fun to work with. Um, 
This is protocol OECD222. This is an earthworm reproduction test, but also a mortality test. Here, we pair our soil and we spike it to the different levels. Note that it's recommended that you have lots of controls. Eight controls is recommended. That's because earthworms are notoriously variable in their responses to things. So having lots of control pots is the way to go. So what we do is we add our earthworms to our pots. Now our earthworms should be about the same age and they should be within two months to one year old. And they should have a visible clitellum. Now the clitellum is the saddle or the band that you see around the earthworm's middle there. That shows that it is an adult earthworm and it's ready to breed. Typically we would use 10 earthworms per 500 grams of soil. But there are lots of variations on that. Some people use fewer worms, um, others use more. I've even seen a few papers published where they have done 10 worms for 50 grams of soil. That's a bit unnatural, but it has been done. But anyway, once we've added our worms, then we incubate, maintain day and night cycles for 28 days, feed them once a week by adding either oats, I tend to use oats, other options are to use dried horse manure, but that makes your, labor your laboratory smell quite a bit, so I tend not to do that option. Then after our 28 days, we remove our earthworms and we count them. The earthworms that are not there anymore are dead, or the ones that aren't moving are dead, and you can calculate the adult mortality. But that's not the end of the story. We can also keep our soil going for another 28 days to see how many cocoons have hatched. So once our adults have been taken out, they have left their eggs behind, which become cocoons and become baby earthworms. And then we can count how many juveniles are produced. So from this one test, we can end up plotting dose response curves for adult mortality, but also reproduction, which is quite useful as it tests for different levels of sensitivity. Reproduction is a more sensitive measure than mortality, for example. Another popular invertebrate assay is the Columbulin reproduction test. This is with Falsomia candida. These are little springtails. These are very small organisms, usually only a couple of millimeters long, and they're in pretty much every soil. So they're another good organism to use because they're representative of environmental situations. Again, we prepare our soil. We spike it up to whatever level we're going to use. Then we place our soil into vessels. These are only small animals, so we can use quite small vessels. Um, little beakers or petri dishes is quite commonly done. So we add our 30 grams of soil, add in our spring tiles, and you'll see on the slide that it says add 10 females. But in reality, spring tiles are almost all females. Um, there's only one in a thousand that are genetically male, so pretty much just put in 10 spring tails and they're going to be all females. They reproduce parthenocarpically or parthenogenetically, so you'd be pretty unlucky if you got one of the males. But we add 10 of our spring tails and they're usually aged with 9 and 12 days, so in order to do that you would have an ongoing population where you can cycle them together. So you put your 10 spring tails into your 30 grams of soil, you add some food, typically some yeast, and then you incubate with day-night cycles for 28 days, again, feeding them with yeast once a week and maintaining their moisture. Then at the end of our 28 days, we count the number of juveniles that are being produced and the number of adults that are still alive. And again, you can do a dose response curve based on mortality and reproduction. Right, so now that we've got all of that data from our various tests, how do we calculate the endpoints? Here we have a dose response curve that is set out in type one approach that I mentioned before. So this is a test where we have set out to determine the no observed effect concentration and the lowest observed effect concentration. Here you see on the y-axis, we have our biological response. So that could be microbial respiration rate, or it might be plant growth yield. And on the x-axis, we have our concentration. 
Now each dot represents a test concentration that we have tried and we have standard errors indicated by the error bars. Now if we were going to identify the no observed effect concentration from this data, we look for the first dot that has an impact relative to the control. And if we did that, we would identify um, the ones there as shown and for our NOEC and LOEC. So our no observed effect concentration is the highest concentration that's had no negative impact. So in this scenario, there's the third dot along that that dot still has effectively zero inhibition. It is statistically the same as our control, but the next dot along, the fourth one, has got a clear impact. So our fourth dot along is our lowest observed effect concentration, so our lowest dose causing a negative impact, and the third one along is our NOEC, our highest dose causing no impact. So now we've got our NOEC and our LOEC. Now, the reason why this approach has become less and less favored over the years is because it is a hostage to the concentrations that you have decided to use. What would have happened if you just didn't happen to have used that third dot point? What if you didn't use 50 milligrams per kilogram as a test concentration? If you hadn't done that, let's say you had only used 0, 25, and 75, then now, as you can see, your NOEC is reading as a much lower concentration. Your LOEC would still be at 75 milligrams per kilogram, but your NOEC is identified as 25. This is the same chemical, the same test, but if you didn't use that 50 milligrams per kilogram test concentration, you would say that your chemical is more toxic than it really is. So as you can see, by using this NOEC and LOEC approach, you really are setting yourself up to be constrained by the individual concentrations that you have imposed. That makes it difficult to compare different studies as well. So that's why over the last 10 or so years, there's been a big movement away from this approach, but it's still in all the literature and you still see it used today. The better approach is approach two, where we're trying to determine the EC10, so the concentration that causes a 10% effect, or the EC50, the concentration that causes a 50% effect. So here what we do is we plot out our data and we fit a line of best fit through it all. Typically this S-shaped curve is what we see. And then through interpolation, we use the line of that curve to determine the EC10 and the EC50. So we read across from the y-axis to look at where our biological response is down to 90%, that's our EC10, where it's down to 50%, that's our EC50. Now note that it's interpolated, so it doesn't matter where the dots are on that curve, the dots give us the curve, and then the curve give us our EC10 and our EC50. So it is much more robust, you can have your concentration set at different levels. As long as you derive the right line, the right curve, you end up with the right EC10 and EC50 values. The other benefit is that it is a precise value that can be calculated, so you can put confidence intervals around these values. So you can have an EC10 plus or minus a well-defined confidence interval, and then you can factor that into any kind of safety measurements you want to add in. So it's a much better way to do it. And if you're interested in looking at the mathematics behind it, you can fit the curve just by eye, or you can use linear regression, or you can use more sophisticated calculations such as a four parameter logistic regression, which is quite a popular way of doing it. It sounds a bit scary, four parameter logistic regression, but it's not really that scary. Your four parameters are just your minimum and your maximum, so there's two. You have your slope, of the line, and the fourth point is your EC50. I don't know about you people, but when I was learning mathematics in school and they made me do differential calculus and I had to determine the inflection point of a line, I often wondered when would I ever use that in my life. Well, here it is. That inflection point of the line, that's the EC50. So that's what the computer is doing underneath it all, is calculating the inflection point to give you that EC50.
So now we've got EC10s and we've got EC50s, but we've got to bear in mind that just from one test, that's only given us the results for one species of one organism type. So we've got a threshold that's useful, but it's only for earthworms or for lettuce or for springtails and not for anything else. It's also only one set of soil properties. If we've only tested one soil, then we've only looked at one type of pH, one level of clay, one level of organic matter. So there's a whole range of other conditions that we need to consider. So if we're going to do a risk assessment and determine concentrations that are safe for the whole environment, we've got to try and integrate values from all different kinds of tests and also factor in that we can't cover everything. So if we're going to assess the environmental risk and derive thresholds that protect whole ecosystems, then we need data for many species, many organism types, and a whole range of soil properties and conditions. But even then, we can't cover everything. So we need to combine all that data and factor in those remaining uncertainties. And in doing that, we can then derive a predicted no effect concentration, or PNEC. And those PNECs are what ultimately become our eco SSLs, our soil screening values. So how do we do that process? How do we derive these PNECs? Well, that's the chemical risk assessment process and that's the subject of the next lecture. So I'll leave you hanging and uh, hope you'll come back and enjoy the next lecture where we will go through how these PNECs are derived. That's it folks. I hope that was useful and interesting. I'll throw over to Margaret. Okay, so thank you, thank you very much, Ian, uh, for your introduction to ecotoxicology and for taking us through uh, the various assays of our uh, microbes, uh, earthworms, and other invertebrates. Um, do we have any questions? I'll start with a question. Um, Ian, with the OECD standard tests, of course, everybody likes a nice standard test, but um, particularly with the, um, the fecundity or reproductive parts of it, where you've put in adults and then you look at, uh, with the earthworms, for example, um, ultimately juveniles that are produced, uh, because you don't know when the adults die, you don't know whether you've had, let's say you have 10 adult earthworms, you don't know whether you've had one offspring from each of those 10 or nine died very soon and one produced all the offspring and that's a very different um, ecotoxicological response, but you get the same number in terms of the, the number of juveniles. So how reasonable is it to actually use that kind of a test to look at um, a reproductive success? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. They, they don't really ad address that very well. What they do is have validity criteria um, which means that you have to have in your controls uh, no more than 20% of your organisms dying. So at least that shows you that your setup is sound and you have to have a certain amount of juveniles being produced in your controls so that you know that conditions are fine for producing juveniles. But in terms of looking at the number of juveniles produced, whether it's from one or all of them, there's no real satisfying way to to tease that data are, are apart. You've, your test condition produces, let's say, 20 juveniles, but you're right, you don't know whether that's one really good mother earthworm and nine rubbish ones, or the, them all producing one or two each. And it really isn't a way to factor that in, other than having lots of tests where you hope that that kind of unusual scenario can't happen all the time. And so, on average, it would balance itself out. But that, yes, there's no way that I'm aware that that's factored in. Do we have other questions? I can't see the chat button at the moment, so there's nothing coming in the chat. Right, that's fine. Um, Ian, I was going to ask you maybe about uh, the setup for experiments, and um, you you um, told us about the fact that you know many of the, the chemicals that we are interested in are are not water soluble, and so there's an approach um, using solvents, and you have to take into account obviously of the solvent behaviour. Um, but um, many of these chemicals um, often have um, 
high vapor pressure. So therefore, that's another aspect of their behavior. Does that need to be taken into account in, in the experiments too? Uh, it, it does. That's why it's very important to confirm your dose because you might lose some of your chemical during the, the test itself. So if you've got a chemical with a high vapor pressure, typically what you would do is add your chemical, mix it through, do any leaching that you're going to do, then you take a sample and you confirm the dose. And then at the end of your test, you take another sample and confirm the dose again and determine how much has been lost for lateralized during the process. And then you can at least quantify how much has been lost. Um, and that's a limitation of the, of, of the process. It's quite difficult to do organic chemicals with high vapor pressure because you lose so much of them. The other thing that's quite difficult to do is nanoparticles because once you add them to the soil, it's hard to confirm that they're still nano and haven't just clumped together, aggregated, and are now just like, say, silver. Um, silver nanoparticles, after two days in the soil, they're probably not nano anymore, so it's now just toxicity of silver. So the regulations and the test protocols are still being adapted to, to try and cope with it. Yeah. Um, Ian, uh, yeah, uh, Ian, I, I apologize because I missed part of your talk. My system crashed and I had to reset it. So you might have covered this. But, um, you know, when we're talking about contaminated sites that we might want to remediate, often these are sites that have had contamination for tens of years, in, in some cases, you know, maybe up to a century. The, um, the chemical forms and particularly the associations of the, some of these chemicals with the various constituents in the soils uh, would, be, would have changed over that time and might be very different than the form in which you add it into your tests. And so how do we, how do we get some comfort level around the fact that the availability of your added contaminant isn't very different than it would be in the uh, in a industrial soil, for example, that we might want to remediate? Yeah, um, it, it, it's a tricky one. But what has been done is that people have tried to find similar soils and have used a field contaminated soil versus a laboratory contaminated soil that have otherwise similar properties and trying to do a calibration approach. Um, others have tried to base it on poor water concentrations, look at the bioavailability aspect that way. But yeah, it's a, that is a tricky one. Um, yeah. Also, have to think about the pollution-induced community tolerance. Your microbes, after centuries of being in a polluted environment, might have adapted to cope with quite a lot of pollution. And so yeah. sometimes what they do is they take the soil out and they inoculate it with something else um, in order to avo avoid those kind of confounding factors. So, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a tricky question. Yeah, and I think that's similar to what um, uh, Michael was asking you. So he said that uh, Doug, Doug beat you <laughs> to, to, to the question. So I think that's the same as what uh, he was yeah. asking about as well. Um, yeah, to have field contaminated soils in, involved in the risk assessment process is very useful. Next week, when I talk about deriving a predicted no effect concentration, you can add in a safety factor to then set your soil limit. If you've got lots of data from true field contaminated soils, then the uncertainty goes down a bit because you're no longer trying to extrapolate between a laboratory situation and a field situation. And so having more field data in there helps you to reduce that uncertainty and gives you more confidence. You can also bring in the bioavailability aspect if your chemical of concern is well understood. Next week, we will talk about lead, zinc and nickel and copper all of which are very well understood and have bioavailability calculations that you can actually use to determine whether in your soil sample they're going to be toxic or not. But other chemicals, even other elements, that data isn't there yet. And so we kind of have to bash our way through. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and, and are all these um, tests done on an individual element or chemical what about the complex mixtures that we have especially with the organic contaminants and uh, there's many many emerging um, 
contaminants that, that uh, we're becoming aware of. Yes, that's a, another important issue. That some of these chemicals will have an additive effect. Some of them will have a synergistic effect. Some of them, it doesn't matter what else is there. So testing chemical one by one is typical what's done to establish the baseline. But then there's also lots of work going on to look at what happens when there are, for example, cadmium and arsenic together in the soil. And then it gets complicated. But yes, there, there is work that goes on to try and work out what happens with multiple contaminants. Um, but yeah, that's a difficult one. Anyone else? Okay, well, given that you've got another lecture next week, I think we'll stop there and then we'll um, join um, again next week and uh, look forward to part two. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, folks.